I wonder if this will get edited out when we uh, when it goes live. Maybe I should do a little sing song. I do a little act for you. We'll get undressed and then redressed before he comes back. <coughs> also, before we went off air, he he's got this blurred thing here. He was <laughs> talking. But I didn't want to blur mine because it's a nice brick wall, isn't it? I like my wall. Sorry about the sniffing. I'll apologise now whilst he's not here. Welcome back, guys, to another episode of the JPS Podcast. And episode 83 is coming at you with Martin McDonald of Mac Nutrition. Now, before we get into the episode, a little bit of housekeeping. Our online mentorship course for 2020 is fast approaching. Our February intake uh, is filling up really quickly, and we do have a limited time offer for early bird enrollments where you'll save $300 on the course price. You can pay upfront or via easy and friendly payment installments. So be sure to check that out if you are somebody who's looking to upskill, improve your knowledge and raise the standard of your personal training. We have curated over 50 hours of content from the likes of Mike Isratel, Brian Miner, Danny Lennon, James Krieger, Brandon Roberts, the guys from Revive Stronger, the JPS crew, and more. And our course is continuing to grow. And if you are one of our students, you will receive a subscription to Mass, monthly applications in strength sports, as well as weightology, and lots, lots more. So link for enrollment is in the description box below. And early bird enrollment is going to end on the 8th of January, 2020. So make sure you check that out. Also guys, our seminars for 2020 have been released. We are coming to Singapore, Bali, we're gonna be in Melbourne, Adelaide, and plenty more. So if you're interested, be sure to check out the JPS website and hopefully we'll see you guys there at one of our seminars to help you learn more about the science and practice of strength, hypertrophy, and fat loss. So in this episode today, Martin and I talk about some really uh, cool stuff uh, that you probably haven't heard Martin talk about before, such as the rapid growth of pathological ideas in the nutrition sphere, uh, how he perceives his role in the industry, and how that has evolved at, over his career, as well as the impacts that has had on him at a personal level and some of the not so obvious struggles that Martin McDonald, uh, the man behind MNU, has faced. So guys, I hope you enjoy this episode. If you do, make sure you like the video, share it on social media, and until next time, enjoy. All right, guys, we are back with Martin McDonald, the owner of Mac Nutrition. Martin, how are you doing? I'm good, thank you very much. A little uh, bit full of cold, so, but I'm all right. I'm coping. Coping, that's the main thing, that's the main thing. And Martin, do you want to tell the guys a little bit about uh, what you've been up to in 2019? I presume most of our followers uh, have an understanding of who you are, so I'm going to Ooh. save them the uh, the boring intros as to you know the qualifications, all that. So what have you been doing this year? Where are you at? So this year, it's been an interesting one. Um, so... Okay, it's funny actually. I saw on like Facebook memories uh, about three years ago, this thing came up saying, oh, I'd really like to go and do some talks in other countries. And so you know, I, I can't remember what I said at the time, but I've, various different points have said, like, oh, at the moment, I'm even saying, anyone who knows anyone in America, tell your friends to follow my stuff if they're interested in nutrition because I want to go to America next. But basically saying I want to do talk in other countries. And as you know, um, I, I ended up doing kind of 15 different kind of tour dates, nine different cities in the UK, because part of it was just a case of, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm not very well known at all, like even in, like in the UK. Um, and it's more kind of online, which then spans, you know, social media, the globe. So yeah, I did like nine different cities in the UK. And the, the main point of it was I'm quite well-known-ish within the fitness and sort of health circles, but more kind of trying to get the general public, So some of my message across to the general public about just decent nutrition, evidence-based nutrition, you know, giving empowering people, kind of taking some of the power back from kind of the, the charlatans out there. And um, <clears throat> so nine in the UK, and then I did just six around. So like did obviously four different 
places in Australia, Sydney, Brisbane, Perth, Melbourne, and then Auckland, um, and then did Dubai as well. So yeah, just touring around doing these talks and obviously came over and visited you guys um, in Melbourne. And so that, that took up most of my year. And honestly, I did not realize it would be, it would take so much planning and organizing, you know, like we, we, we've got good at doing events through our kind of two graduations a year. And, um, but honestly, just even just managing people coming to the talks, it's like, oh, you know, last minute, is there anything there? Or something like dropping out the day before or the week before. And like, I, I, I'm, I'm too nice in that. I'm like, oh, I'll try and sort out your ticket with those kind of people. So anyway, it took a lot out of me and it took a lot of manpower. But honestly, it probably was the highlight of my career so far. Um, I flipping loved it, it's especially Australia. Um, I, it's just kind of like the people, the fact that I think I came so far, everyone was so much more welcoming. You know, it's like, oh my goodness, you've come this far to see us. Um, so it was it was class. Um, so yeah, this, this the tour was amazing. And now getting some of the feedback from people who came along. Um, other than that, we had our biggest intake of MNU, which is obviously our, our kind of online qualification um, ever this year, 30, 37 minutes the, the whole year, every place filled. Um, yeah, and then it's kind of just been then getting our feet again, planning for 2020 and kind of for things to come. Fantastic. And uh, I can attest to the fact that your presentation in Melbourne was uh, world class, mate. So, yeah, well, I'm sure uh, everyone else uh, enjoyed having you down. And I guess let's talk a little bit about uh, the nutrition industry uh, as a whole. Uh, you were talking about uh, off, off the air how there's some changes going on uh, in the UK, uh, which is affecting um, practicing uh, nutritionists, dietitians and so forth, I presume. Um, but I wanted to start before we get into that. Why do you think that the nutrition industry is so unique uh, and the fitness industry as a whole uh, in its ability to uh, spread and allow like pathological ideas to grow so rapidly? You see a lot of other scientific fields. Uh, it's very hard for an idea to just come out of nowhere with no research behind it, no scientific data, um, and just take over completely, whereas you just have one little thing such as, um, you know, the bananas fucking girl or whatever name is on Instagram, and it, oh, yeah. just, it just takes off and, you know, people everywhere are doing it, knowing about it, um, and then all of a sudden uh, practitioners are caught on the back foot. So what is it about the nutrition industry that you think allows uh, this to happen? Yeah, I think there are two things, and this is just off the top of my head, but the two main things I think of that are probably about it is the, the experiential element of our industry. So with science and other types of science, so let's take something really obvious for everyone, I hope, flat earthers. And I kind of make a joke during my tour talk about, do you know that there are people in the world who genuinely think, like it's not a joke, they genuinely think the earth is flat. Um, these people exist. In that sense, there's no experience. No one experiences a flat earth. They don't go, oh, I was like doing this yesterday and then I started, someone told me the earth was flat and I was like, oh yeah, I feel so different, you know. So, but with nutrition, you have this element of no, and I've written this before, no amount of science is going to convince someone that their experience isn't true. And the problem is, is people love extremes. And so no matter what you say, they hear the extreme. So if you're like, you know, talking about ketogenic diets or veganism or this, these fruitarians, the, the banana girl that you mentioned, someone experiences that, you know, they see something with their own eyes. Well, this girl, eats whatever it is, like 50 bananas a day, and she's got great boobs, and she's skinny, and she has good chat on Instagram, and she's got loads of followers. I don't even know if she's on Instagram. She's massive on YouTube, that girl, isn't she? She's huge. Is it like... Um, yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not too sure. No? Okay. 
She's, I mean, I don't think she's around that much anymore, but I, she's a funny one because I don't, probably people don't know that she exists anymore. But anyway, don't know where she's gone. So they see, they, they, they can observe this. Well, there's something there. How, what makes you wrong? What makes you right and her wrong? Because she looks like this and she's doing this and she's getting on. And isn't that just your opinion and those kind of things? So if someone does keto and they go, well, you know, I've done these other things before and then I did keto and it worked. So you, maybe your science hasn't caught up. They, they, they hear, you're saying it doesn't work. And it's like, no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that lots of the zealots who are maybe trying to make money out of this, it's very easy to make money selling myths in the nutrition and fitness industry, especially when people have des- you know, the desperation element. If someone has cancer, very easy to go, you know, stop all your cancer treatment. The medical establishment is, is whack have this bicarbonate of soda and eat this out, al- drink this alkaline water, very easy to take a lot of money in a short space of time. So for evil people, there's that element, but that, you know, there's these, what I call these well-meaning idiots. There's these people who go, oh, you know, I, I went on the shake plan and it, you know, I did lose weight. So there must be something in it. Like, I don't, I know you're a scientist and you're a nutritionist and you're a personal trainer, but you know, I did lose a lot of weight. So I think maybe you just need to catch up with us and find out why it works. And it's like, no, we know why it works. We understand all of this. You know, this has been around for decades. We understand. Um, so the experiential, and, and, and if you're not a good communicator and it's online, people just get into arguments. That's rubbish. You're an idiot, this, that, and the other. Whereas, you know, as opposed to like the difficult thing is sitting back and going, I hear you. I hear you've had this experience. I'm not trying to take away your experience. Um, And but the reason this happened is this. Then the problem is, is then they go, well, I don't care why it happened. It happened. So I'm going to tell other people about it. And then they become religious about it. And they don't understand, you know, people going to me, well, you said this, Martin, well, it worked for me. And I'm like, how long ago did you do it? A year. And I'm like, cool. Well, the research shows in two years, you're going to be screwed or whatever. And it's just, they're just like, you know, like the whole clean eating thing. And, you know, well, I eat clean and I have cheat days. And, you know, my coach got me doing cheat days. And you know, I don't have an eating disorder. And like, I don't have a poor relationship. And it's like, you took up bodybuilding six months ago, mate. Like, give it time and you'll screw your relationship. Like, ignore me all you want. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to take anything away from you. I'm just trying to give you some foresight that I never had. And I was misled and I ended up in a bad place. Um, and the second part, if that sounded like one part, the second part is just the fact that everyone eats. So everyone's an expert. So it's like, I'm not going to enter into debates about, you know, astrophysics or these other, you know, whether the earth is flat or not, because I, I, I don't know about those. I don't, I've got some experience of walking on the world and being in a plane and, and whatever, but there's no you know, I am not those things, whereas everyone eats, everyone's got their own experience. And, you know, you have got these slight genetic differences, which might make people feel different in different ways. So for me, those are the two reasons that it's just like, that's your opinion, Jacob. But this is, you know, and you're going, no, this, that's science. It's not my opinion, that's science. And they're going, mm, but I've got my science. <laughs> and the whole, well, you can find a study to show you anything. And, you know, that's just your opinion. It's like, cool, just tell me about gravity. How's that working out for you? It's like, these are laws of thermodynamics. They're not opinions. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's my opinion. Why it just, it's, I don't think we'll ever tame that crap, but I think we can definitely improve it. Um, and that's what I know yourself and many of us are trying to do. Yeah, no, I, I like that answer. Those um, very thorough. And in saying that, uh, I'd love to hear your take on uh, the recent Game Changers uh, documentary. You don't have to go in and debunk it um, because I'm sure uh, that's been done a million times by a million other different uh, individuals and we don't need to bore the listeners with that stuff. Um, But why is it that these documentaries are able to portray such a one-sided um, you know, biased view of the research that, that is, you know, quite, um, you know, instilling fear in people. It's fear mongering. And I'm, I'm confused as to how this isn't more tightly regulated 
um, you know, and there isn't somebody who is uh, responsible for you know, controlling the dissemination of this type of information, especially on uh, such big media platforms as Netflix. What are your thoughts on uh, that kind of uh, issue? Yeah, I think <clears throat> I think our main issue is, you know, if you take a step back from Netflix, you've got the news and kind of major media outlets that are, I suppose, like Netflix is predominantly entertainment and therefore the newspaper is not supposed to be entertainment and may, and then but maybe in between Netflix and the newspaper you've got magazines that are you know supposed to be giving you some facts the fact that starting with the news which is supposed to be factual and we've you know society has allowed newspapers to become so you know mythical in nature they're not factual we're not relying on experts anymore you know the the internet has allowed kind of lots of ideas and things to propagate and we are now such a culture of wanting instant gratification people don't have the time and because the money makes the world go round there's so much greed in the world most things are pushed by money so do you have a newspaper that's competing against another newspaper and whoever can get the, it out first gets more money so then we are looking at speed over quality you know quantity over quality type scenario so you go back to there you move forward to netflix it's like why would we ever think that netflix had any element of wanting to to promote the truth like it's simply a channel to push views and to entertain and like i genuinely am not sure if there's any whatsoever so when i did some work in kind of me the media some of the stuff i did for various athletes or celebrities i worked with it had to because it was being advertised it had to go through like the advertising standards agency and so they had would have like professors professors of dietetics look at stuff that i did to um to then say whether it could go on tv and that's that's advertising and in the uk we're a bit better at that in you know, like generally in europe we're a lot better than america the difference between the claims that you can make in europe i think it's efsa you know you have to have a certain number of uh, of controlled trials showing something before you can make certain claims in america i think i think someone can call me out on this it's one or let's maybe say two white papers which literally means a scumbag company creates a product does an internal crappy little study doesn't have to have it peer reviewed and just puts a paper in pdf form on the internet and calls it a white paper and then they can go this did this is ridiculous so anyway so some of my stuff an interest the funny story i when I put forward, uh, I did some nutrition for someone and it, it was going in some form of advertorial. And I think I, I had like a multivitamin on there because they were in, in a calorie deficit. And I was like to cover some bases and had that. And I think the person, I don't think I know, they were eating oats for breakfast because they enjoyed oats. And this professor of dietetics, and this is part of like lots of people will know some of the disdain I have for the dietetic establishment. The, some of the comments came back. One of them was, there's no sources of calcium in this diet, d despite the fact that they were using whey protein. And I'm like, mm, do you know that? And the problem is, is I'm like, I'm hearing this, you know, dietetic speak of like, oh, it's a supplement. It's like, do you actually have any idea what whey, whey protein is? There's no sources of calcium in this diet. I was like, well, that's a farce. And then secondly, it was um, the, the fact that um, there is been shown a need for a multivitamin and mineral here shows that this diet probably isn't you know nutritionally adequate the next comment was there is no fortified cereals in this nutrition plan and i was like what i was like do you understand and so i'm like writing back no idea who the other person on the other end is and because you, you're not supposed to know but i later found out it was this professor of dietetics but basically going you need to put in some kellogg's cornflakes that are fortified with you know, man-made synthetic vitamins and minerals, which is the same thing as a multivitamin, but also, you know, you're putting in these kind of more refined sources of carbohydrate, which I don't necessarily want to promote. Um, not that they're bad, but they're just not something that we want to promote to people. Unbelievable. Anyway, so why is it Netflix 
regulated? Like, A, who's going to regulate it if we've got the good areas? And Netflix is just entertainment. And so it's just there for people to do whatever the hell they like with it. But there's no money or interest. Like, try and make, like I've been quoted as saying, like, we need to make the middle ground sexy. And that's a frigging difficult thing to do Um, versus extremism. You know, the carnivore diet, veganism, like, let's go crazy. And so you can get anyone, you know, people go, oh, well, they had scientists and they had doctors on there. And it's like, these people are human. Like, it doesn't matter who you are. If you have, especially with veganism, if you have a strong ethical, moral feeling towards animal products, it's like these things bias people hugely. So you want to see the good in everything and you want to you want to shout the house down of how you can survive without drinking milk. Um, so, yeah, I just think that we shouldn't even try and chase that. Like we should just try and educate as many people that Netflix is not somewhere they should be getting nutrition advice from in any way, shape or form. Like stop wasting your life. Like if you find it entertaining, I don't know why you would watch that rather than like the Avengers. Like, why are you wasting time watching a documentary? But yeah, it gives you something to talk about with your friends. But if you're literally going there to go, well, I just wanted to know if there was anything good in there. Like, don't, don't, because you're just going to confuse yourself. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree uh, totally that it is an uphill battle, but I feel attacking it from the top down, having institutions or organizations, uh, you know, monitoring what uh, goes through is going to be a much, uh, I guess, easier task than trying to come from the bottom up. Mm. Um, so, yeah. Just, I just don't know if it's possible. You yeah. know, like, this because the money that Netflix has. Yeah. I just don't know who would have the power to do that. But, I mean, you are right. If you could do that, that would be more effective. Mm. It would be amazing. But I just feel like it could be a bit like fighting tobacco companies yeah. without the fact that Netflix doesn't cause lung cancer. <laughs> Well, it causes uh, people to have pathological ideas, and I think that's yeah. they're they're a cancer to to uh, other humans in many in many cases. Um, yeah. So moving on, uh, how has your role in the nutrition sphere changed? I'd like to hear your thoughts on how you perceive it, because obviously everybody else has this idea of Martin McDonald, and over the years, I'm sure um, you know your. Uh, role has changed in their eyes, um, as I'm sure it probably has on your end as well, because now you obviously have uh, you know your own establishment, um, you're getting more and more employees, you're doing all these tours, traveling. Um, I'm sure you're more of a influencer and educator than you probably um, were five, ten years ago. So uh, where do you see yourself now in comparison to five years ago and when you first started? Yeah, wow. So, um, I guess now, yeah, I I feel like I, I was actually talking to, um, yeah, it's funny, I was talking to Sarah, so she's like head of nutrition at Mac Nutrition, and um, so just recently I've had so many requests to speak internationally, and going back probably, like you said, five, ten years, that was my goal. Like, I just love speaking. Like, speaking publicly just gives me life. I would, and I pretty much said I'd love to make a living from just speaking, just educating. Um, the bigger the audience, the better. Um, and it's, and, you know, and funny, like, given the tour, the tour was never really supposed to make any money or profit because it was so much bigger than expected. It ended up making, like, you know, something that someone could live off as a wage for a year. And really, it was just this side gig, this hobby thing that I did in my spare time from running my company. Um, but so that, that was like kind of nice. And then just recently talking about uh, getting all of these requests to speak internationally. And I was like, isn't that mad, Sarah, that it's all happening? But I sort of don't I'm not giving myself any credit. Or I don't necessarily feel overly happy or about it because a I'm stressed I'm busy and I've like I, I, I hate saying no to people I hate letting people down um you know I've got pod I've got about 25 podcast requests that I've got to like get through in roughly the next six to 12 months um you know people have been waiting legitimately like a year to get me uh, to get me on and what one guy actually has just graduated from MNU and I'm pretty sure he asked me to go on his podcast before he started it so I'm like 
mate, you just graduated. I said, like, I'll do it. I'll do it soon. Um, but my role has just, it's weird. And I, I kind of, I do feel still slightly awkward in when you start kind of talking a bit like you're Jesus or a bit like you're um, a thought leader. Like I've been called a thought leader and I, I genuinely probably get off on the idea of being a thought leader, you know, like, uh, you know, Aristotle, like, but not, but not as grand as them because they're like humankind. They're like geniuses. Their job was to think they would, they would think of, you know, metacognition, thinking about thinking. But for me, yeah, I do. I think about the industry a lot. I think about the best thing for people for how we can change it you know i get asked my opinion a lot which then makes me think more about it um so i feel like my role yeah it's like and, and even seeing how powerful my words are like the way people now react to me like some kind of celebrity sometimes it's weird and I, like i'm i absolutely freaking love it and i've never hidden the fact that my goal since for as long as i can remember was to be famous not for money, like money has been a complete byproduct of anything I've ever done, but I've always wanted to be famous. Um, like, and I'm talking like Will Smith famous. That's like my childhood dream. So like any element of that, walking through LA airport, being in Australia, you know, just random places. Like I was walking through London, someone, you know, stopping me, asking for a selfie. Like, I like, I'm like, that's so cool. And I've got a lot of time for people. And but then there's now this element of being sort of like mini famous within it, within a nutrition, fitness, health industry. I love it because I also, this is another funny thing to say, right? Because it just seems like you're kind of arrogant and I'm not arrogant with it. And I don't know if it's the way I was brought up or it's just like, I just think I'm wise. I'm like, so now with MNU, like talking about your point, like what's your role? I've become an, I've become a mentor. Like I'm, qualifying and teaching and mentoring thousands of people in a very specific area but also I'm I've become like a mentor on life as well so I'm like students and these are adults these are grown men and women but coming to me with and 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 this is another area which I never ever ever foresaw but when you mentor that many people closely like I have so many people supporting me within my staff that I'm able to do a lot as, as part of my career. So, you know, I'm dealing with stuff I never imagined, like broken marriages, people on the brink of suicide, people with really, really bad mental health, people going through massive addictions. And, and I'm like, I've suddenly become like this father figure. I've got this, I've always had a very pastoral element to my character. Um, and because I'm a father and because I'm a very um, overt, parent you know or like as in I show people I'm a parent and I love it and it's a big part of my life um and having kind of been a baby person you know like worked volunteered within creches looking after babies for for, for you know years um I'm I'm now getting people like asking me parenting advice and was there anything you did and like it, it's crazy um so my role is just something totally different and I love it um I actually don't think I was ever necessarily fully cut out to be a great one-on-one -on -one coach. I think I'm a decent nutritionist, whether, you know, just some, a level of emotional intelligence, a level of understanding what works, a relatively personable person. Um, but I think my real calling is what I'm doing now is educating a wider kind of audience, maybe not necessarily just fitness professionals, but because of the way I speak, I think sometimes I lose the attention of maybe the people that lots of coaches have listened to them, um, which I don't like, which I think through my tour, I managed to gain a lot more general layperson, general public followers who are, who I do want to influence. I feel like I've got to give back to that kind of group, but, um, yeah, so like my role is just a bit weird. Like stuff I say actually makes a difference. Like it gets talked about. I get all these screenshots of like, look at this. They're all talking about you. Look at this. And these are like big, big organizations. Like I said, you kind of mentioned that this got this petition going where I'm basically changing the, the future or I, I'm not changing. I'm trying to change. 
I'm trying to swerve the ball, the movement of basically what will impact at government level the regulation to some extent of nutrition professionals in the UK and somewhat worldwide. Um, and people are like, you're the man to do this. And I'm like, man, I never would have thought that was going to be me, someone to to do that and to ha to be a, like I, I'm an, a natural born leader, but I never thought that was w what I would be leading. I thought I'd be leading my team, uh, you know, within my company or, you know, just leading a real small group of people at the top of the fitness industry who are trying to do similar things in similar places. You know, the, the leader that is like the 10 people that you bring to Melbourne for UEBC, like that kind of leader, not maybe what I'm, these other things, but yeah, it's, it, it's changed massively. Like everything's, the whole game has changed for me. Um, and but I'm loving it. That's very cool. Yeah. So moving uh, forward on to uh, the next question that I had to follow up uh, the previous one. <coughs> What has all of that change in your perception of self meant for you as a person? So behind uh, the gambit that is the thought leader, the you know, well put together, the very suave communicator of nutrition, all of those sorts of things that you are and you are known for online, um, yeah, I, I'm very much aware that, uh, yeah, we do put out this gambit of, of a person who wants to be um, online because there is expectations, there's responsibilities, there are things that we need to do uh, to run a business, but behind the scenes, uh, there, there's a human. Uh, so, so what has all of this change meant for you on a personal level uh, as a father and a person? I know that for the most part, you do love it, and I know that you uh, are very sincere and genuine when you say that because I, I've met you and mm. I, I was... I was very uh, skeptical. I thought this guy's going to be, you know, all show, no go, um, you know. And I was, I was skeptical. And then when I met you, I was like, "Nah, he's a fucking real deal," um, <laughs> which was really cool. And it's not often that I sort of have that experience with people because uh, generally, what you see online is not what you get uh, in real life. But the two, Ooh. the two, very much married up. So, I, so I'm not uh, saying that what you put out is something different to who you are in person, but yeah. I do know that, um, yeah, that you've had some struggles, some battles mm. as a person, and that comes with uh, the responsibilities and expectations that you uh, carry on your shoulders as somebody who's grown in the industry. So how has all this change, yeah, uh, yeah changed you as a person? Yeah, so um, firstly, thanks for the compliment. It's nice. Uh, and it's, this is one thing for like anyone who cut off the back of this comes and kind of listens to the podcast is like on my Instagram stories, which, which is a weird thing has become my best work. And it sucks that they are, um, not permanent, <laughs> that they are literally there for 24 hours. Um, but I try to be so kind of real on those stories in that, you know, and, and there is a massive way up within that in terms of, because there's so many fakes, like you just said, like people are like one thing on the internet and different, you know, in real life, you, I see that. And then I don't like, I, I see being real then as this, like, you see people just doing attention seeking behaviors. You see, you know, you even see some of these like business mentor gurus, telling their telling their um i don't know what they're called clients i guess to cry on camera to basically pull on people's heartstrings to get them to buy high ticket sale products and this that and the other and it's just like flip and i, I could i could never bring myself to like cry on camera like that would be flipping weird um but I kind of talk about the fact that, yeah, there are days when it's really freaking hard. And, and I am actually a very emotional person. Like when I spoke in Sydney, so freaking embarrassing. And when I was like, I'm like, oh, I'm such a crybaby. People are like, oh, don't, don't be down on yourself. I'm like, I'm not down on myself. But some people cry more than others. Like I cry at films all the time. Like I cannot help it. I get into the storyline and I'm like bawling with tears. And on stage in Sydney, when I was like thanking everyone for coming, I literally just started crying. And I couldn't talk. And it was it was horrific in terms of embarrassing. And I know everyone there was super supportive and nice, but no one wants to cry in front of one person, let alone let alone uh, wherever it was, 250 people. So um, I tried to be super real. And 
And so I talk about the fact that um, I have days where I'm super lonely. So, you know, and I think I, I've spoken about this in terms of business mentors, like it needs to be spoken about more that you sacrifice so much. Like I have sacrificed friendships and relationships, like really good friendships and really good rela- uh, friendships and relationships and be, uh, because I do personally believe I'm kind of doing it for like a, there's a higher purpose I feel like I'm what I'm doing is kind of what I'm called to do um, and that makes it kind of sound very grand but th- this this is why like going back to your previous questions of like I'm not just a nutrition person anymore I do feel like I've got a lot to offer the world like I've got Instagram highlights on self-esteem and it's funny actually when you're like people portray this thing on the internet and and I was I basically said I have super high self-esteem like complete self-value like I think I'm amazing and you know I actually talked recently on on my Instagram for the first time about some mental health struggles I went through and um, like you know I won't go into detail but just the bad mental health things that people go through and at that time a lot of that was not through thinking I was crap it was pretty much I was so depressed and just didn't want to be around anymore because I had so little faith in humanity and other in other human beings and um, the stress the, the other stresses of life there was like financial issues because of the fact that I was doing the right thing and I was trying to protect people and I was helping people and I was do- saying the stuff that other people don't want to say, the stuff that people still don't want to say. Like I'm doing this petition, trying to make the world a better place, trying to ma- not let us make a decision in history that will impact the rest of time. And people are coming to me in private going, this is amazing. And I'm like, why aren't you saying that publicly? Oh, because I'll look bad. Oh, because people will talk about me. Oh, because of this. And I'm like, you're why are you such a coward why like you know I like these people but I'm like have a spine like do something that isn't for yourself for once just put yourself out there and so it's kind of quite well known that I was you know I've been sued quite a few times a couple of times it's very serious and it put massive strain on me myself my family my living and um so I was just I was sick of life and um so but at the same time like I have this I do have this like massive self-esteem because and and when I talk about in the in these Instagram stories that you can't that are still there I've made them sort of permanent in terms of a highlight but how you view your self-esteem is very different and you know I was like oh I'm not worth anything that some people have this horrible like thing that they can't get rid of and they but so yeah and some of my friends and, and acquaintances were like I don't, I don't believe that. They were like, I don't think anyone thinks that much of themselves. And I was like, yeah, like I get that you don't think that. And then people meet me and I'm just like, I genuinely think I'm great. And I want other people to feel the way I do about myself because, and the way you, the way you wrap up self-esteem. If you understand that a lot of your self-esteem is what you can offer back to world. What can you give to the world? We all have so much to offer. And then I get all these messages from me. I've got nothing to offer. I'm like, you do. You genuinely do. You need to stop going, I haven't got money. Like people think, oh, I haven't got money, so I can't help. Rubbish. Like I wish I had more time to help the world. But like a simple smile, like all of these things you can do, like go to Africa, like somehow get yourself to Africa and show what you can actually offer other human beings. Um, so being confident, yeah, like, confident that anything can make the world a better place. Any- yeah. Just it, you have a house, you could literally go to someone on the street and just go, do you want to come and use my house for a shower? Like you'll change someone's life. It's so freaking easy. A smile, like you smile at someone who's a, who's going to commit suicide that night and it changes. A conversation, a cup of, you know, is, there's endless possibilities. Um, so I think the main thing that has changed for me is just the pressure. And like I have to, I have to, um, I some of my shortcomings I have a I have a very short temper um don't know why um I need to keep working on the counseling to like sort myself out I have a super short temper um and so having massive stress like I've got all of this net hate coming at me about this petition people are saying hateful things about me that it's about money it's about business I'm only doing it for myself and then you have the pressure of you're serving all these people as a business. And I put so I put my life 
and soul into my business. But people forget that. They see money, fame, Instagram stories, and then they just, they hate on you. They, you know, are, you know, you're, you're managing expectations from people and people feel shame. Someone fails MNU and I have to message someone who I've mentored for a year and go, you failed. I'm going to support you through this, but then they feel shame and then they, they attack. That's what people do. They attack and they, you didn't support me. Well, this is ridiculous. How much is it for a reset? That's a fast. This is a rip off. You're a sellout. And it's like one minute ago for the last 12 months, I was the best thing since sliced bread. You were loving the course. We'd supported you so much. You would have paid double for M and U, but then they just get this. So then, you know, daily when you're supporting this many people, you get people getting upset and then you've got your inbox filled with people who are like, my life is falling apart. What can I do? And then so we're there supporting them. So for me, I just feel like the main thing that's happened is I've had to kind of create tools, although that makes it sound way more grand and, and organized. I'm a very, very disorganized person. Um, I've just recently kind of started using a PA, like, you know, and a full time, she walks around with me, just goes, you know, she like went home today and she texts me literally she went home an hour and 15 minutes before this. And, and we were just talking about it and the room was getting set up and she goes, remember Jacob at eight o'clock. And it's like having people babysit me in that way has been helpful. But yeah, the, the kind of way it's changed me is it's really just the pressure. But also, do you know what the one this is like probably the what I should have said to your question. The short version of the answer is, is I'm having to fight entitlement which I'm not an entitled person. And I think entitlement is like a real crap thing about humans. They think they deserve something. They think, you know, and, and even myself, actually, in my younger years, I went through a period in my career where I thought I was entitled to, I had done all the study. I had worked really freaking hard. I'd never sold out to anything. And I thought I deserve to not be working seven days a week and be earning a more stable income. And I thought I deserved to have more followers and more influence. And I got super, super bitter about it. Um, but in general, I've not been an entitled person. And you see people who get a bit of fame or a bit of money and they become entitled and they're a bit, you know, the, the people they talk to or hang around with changes. And that hasn't happened to me. But the, the way entitlement has affected me is people disrespecting me so oh will you do this podcast yeah sure i'd love to I'm not going to charge you any money I'm not going to like i'd love to do that because i feel honored that you would want to talk to me and then they're like oh yeah um will you you know they'll say something just a bit disrespectful like what what is it you're known for what is it you like would be good to talk about and so i have to fight the instant thing of like are you having a laugh I've, I'm going to give up my time. And it's like, who are you, Martin? It's like, I'm a really busy person and I'm going to give my time to you for free, but at least do some frigging work. So I have to fight that negativity of entitlement of just being like, you know what? I am an absolute nobody in the grand scheme of things. And there is a level of, yeah, you know, people can be respectful, but, um, that, that, that comes across. Like I wouldn't meet a stranger and go, Hmm, do you know who I am? Like never. Um, I'm always unbelievably surprised when you know like when i came to your event and people were like oh yeah you know like you you've been someone i've been really looking forward to here i'm like what really it's like super complimentary um but yeah that that is one thing how it's changed me is um i'm so busy and i give so much back for free when if someone just dms me and they don't say hi martin they just go What's a good whey protein? I've literally got no time for that at the minute with my mental I'm like, you don't even say hi. You haven't even said thank you very much for the free content. You you just literally come in with, or do you know the worst one? What song is that in the back of your story? First DM they've ever sent me. They've never tagged me in their story. They've never mentioned me. They've never gone, this is a good person. What's that song? I'm not replying to you. And that is like, do you know what I mean? So I just have, I have to like that's the one thing I'm constantly now realizing I'm changing in that way, and I need to not be entitled. Very interesting, very interesting, and I think uh, it is somewhat expected as you have more and more people uh, following you and reaching out for help, advice, and wanting to know what you're all about, that you're going to have some people who just have no uh, common courtesy or decency. So 
yeah, buckle up, man, and enjoy the ride. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Martin, I guess uh, we'll wrap up. What are your plans in 2020? What's happening on your end? Anything you want to plug? Uh, shoot. Yeah, the the main thing. I'm going to plug three things. The first one is is if you are a listener in the um, in Canada was or that, America. Wait, wait, was that innuendo then that you wanted to plug three things? I'm just not sure if I can keep up these days, man. That genuinely, that genuinely <laughs> wasn't. And that's because I'm ill. So I want to fill you in. <laughs> no, so <laughs> yeah, so three things. Um, what is it? Shocker, rocker, showstopper. Anyway, so so three things. First one is my tour. So I want to go and do basically what I did in Australia and Dubai, New Zealand, but in America and Canada. So if you're listening to this and you're already a follower of mine and you and you're in those in, in America or Canada, log on to my, um, probably just go on my Instagram in the bio and it's like a thing just to register your interest because I need to kind of, America is so flipping big, I need to kind of see where people are and then like pick a few talk places so that as many people can come as possible. And it's easy, like in Australia, like Australians are flipping great. It's like you just go to Melbourne and Sydney and you get everyone just coming from everywhere. And it's like massive density, whereas America's so spread out. Anyway, so that's the first thing is like, if you want to hear me speak publicly, I'm a very, very good and engaging speaker. <laughs> um, <laughs> see, self-esteem. No, Jacob will tell you if you don't believe me. And the it's second true. one is just it, this, um, thank you, this petition, anyone over the world can sign it. And just this is just a favor I'm asking to, to, to Jacob's listeners, basically, is go and sign the petition. Again, the link's in my Instagram bio. And um, to be honest, if you listen to this after the, the 2nd of January 2020, don't go looking for it. Um, it's a bit of a fast-paced moving thing. So, yeah, anyone who listened to it before then, go have, a, go have a read of it and sign if you agree. And the third thing is not as important, but basically, yeah, in 2020, we're looking to basically do a layperson's version of Mac Nutrition Uni that we, you know, initially it was called like this family nutrition course, this like be your own nutrition course. But really, it's just so many people wanting to do MNU, which is quite an expensive course for someone who's not going to use it for a job. Um, it's like going to university to just go, oh, yeah, this is what I'm going to feed my kids tonight. It's crazy. Um, takes out all of the stuff you don't need to know, all the practitioner skills and behavior change and whatever, and it just drills down to the stuff that's helpful for you and your family. Um, so that will be later in 2020 if, if people are interested in, in, and that's something that they would want to hit me up for. So, yeah. Very cool, very cool. I'll make sure I put uh, yeah any relevant links uh, to those uh, sources in the description box uh, for this podcast. So, guys, you can check that out below. Martin, thank you very much for your time, man. Uh, this was a really enjoyable podcast uh, episode and always a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks so much, Jacob.